Um, thank you, Philip, and your team. I will not take much of your time. We are where Church of Pentecost was uh, uh, in 1937 when they started, I think it was. So that's where we are. That's where we're finding ourselves. And uh, it's quite challenging to speak after such a wonderful presentation. But then um, again, I need to extend my gratitude to you, Philip. I still ask that question, uh, Louisa, why did you guys choose us to come and, and speak? But we thank God for his grace. And to all the church leaders that are here, Prof, thank you very much for the opportunity. I will speak briefly about the role of the African uh, Pentecostal churches in social development. And I'll try to narrow it down to the little role that we have played so far. Our church, Covenant House Family Church, was founded by myself and my wife about eight years ago. And uh, like Philip rightly said, we, we, we saw the need because uh, the attention was drawn mostly to the people with needs and poor. And so we would give out stuff to them in trying to want to help. And then later on we realized that, look, this is not going to work. We need to find a, a sustainable way of helping our people. And indeed, we, we started a school about four years ago, uh, which is doing very well. And uh, uh, we have now about uh, 50 to 60 students. And this is a school that accommodates children from the age of six months to seven years. And the reason why we chose to do that is because we wanted to empower children from an early age. Our education system is quite uh, challenged. I think my colleagues from back home will agree with me that you find uh, a lot of children who don't even qualify to enter university because of the foundation that uh, well, they, they were exposed to. So we took it upon ourselves and uh, we went and did all the legal formalities to get the school registered, which is running very well. And even now that we are here, the classes are going on. Um, and now back to my notes here and the little notes that I have made here and there. So I'll be here and there just to give you some of the things that really challenged us to take that uh, uh, stance into wanting to start um, the early childhood development facility that we have started. We, we like it was already said that uh, African Pentecostal churches, uh, the Pe Pentecostal movement was. Uh, started or evolved somewhere around the 20th century and the introduction of this gave birth to a formidable church movement that have seen a whole lot of poor people coming together and as I speak now you half of the society back in South Africa belongs to one or other of this church so basically the church itself is inverted is right in the midst of where the people are. And so based on that, we then realize to say we are best positioned because we have got more voice, sometimes even better than the state itself. And gathering people just to just meet one aspect of their needs, which is spiritual, will not be enough. We then need to take a stance as the church and uh, add value into their lives. Um, in there's a writing that I picked, uh, uh, a 1976 writing by Lake, who says the early Pentecostal movement did not consist of professionals, and uh, but it consisted of the poor, the disfranchised, uh, 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 um, and, and the laborers, and these poor people lack some kind of formal education uh, and and even theological training. They also believed that all you needed. <laughs> to start or even to be part of this church was only the, the, to be saved and the baptismal of the Holy Spirit. And um, one of the uh, more distinctive features of the past traditional Pentecostal church was, like I said, you know, there was no formal training or any formal uh, kind of education according to uh, Muller's writing of 1975. Some, some also believed that there was no need, and here was why the way the gospel was preached was that Jesus is coming anytime, and so there's no need to go to school, 
there's no need to go to university. And so the waiting went on and on. And so for very long, the gospel message was centered around uh, the pilgrimage uh, metaphor by Bainab uh, uh, as progress in which the faithful are constantly admonished to focus or were constantly admonished to focus on their uh, heavenly goal. You get saved and then you wait to go to heaven. This to an extent explained the social and political non-involvement of the African church at that time. And this created a sharp uh, uh, the, the economy between the social, uh, 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 the secular and the sacred. So I wouldn't concern myself at that time. But then there was a great uh, uh, kind of ev ev evolving that took place, just like you see, a point, point in case with the Church of Pentecost, and the church began to be involved in social development. And according to Anderson, every believer upon receiving Christ as their Lord and were baptized in the Holy Spirit, this is now what is contributing, uh, based on my observation, contributing into the fast growing pace of the Pentecostal church, is that according to this writing here, is that upon receiving Christ, and be filled with the Holy Spirit, it is the responsibility of every individual believer now then to take the gospel to others. So we take it personally, take it upon myself that I have received this of the Lord and therefore I need to pass it on to somebody else. And so this kind of approach has seen the, the Pentecostal church grow and which is what we still hold on. The professor has highlighted to the same that when people would move from their locality to another place they would get there and see the need to establish a church. And that kind of an approach has seen the church grow. However, the formation of the independent Pentecostal churches has come with its own challenges. Um, there's a writing by a Ghanaian writer, Akuse K. Dakwa, who writes that the faith, uh, rather he writes, although the trend is changing in recent times, uh, of, of, of the development of the Pentecostal church. Unfortunately, uh, to the other extreme, where through the prosperity gospel, the end goal of the faith is understood or was understood as material gain. And that God or the God of faith is deemed an, an, an alterian God whose main interest is the temporal comfort of the faithful. So here is a challenge that we see now with the formation of the, the Pentecostal Charismatic Church because unlike the mission-founded churches, it became very easy to establish an independent church. In the process of that, the challenge that they came with and the, the challenge that it brought was so much of the prosperity gospel where one will start a church with the motives of enriching themselves and, 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 and so forth and so on. And uh, he goes on to write, as a result of the high currency of the gospel in the sub-Saharan sub, sub, uh, Africa, the faithful in the region have been encouraged to practice in the global economy, mainly as consumers and never producers of wealth. So this has seen just a small group of people benefiting from the mushrooming or the starting of these in, uh, 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 independent churches. And I stand here as one who says, look, this has to change. We need some form of accountability and an understanding. And I'm saying this because, not because of the presentation itself. My wife is here with me. When we started our church eight years ago, based <coughs> on the needs that we saw, at some point, we even sold our car and started working to make sure that the church is established. As I'm talking to you today, I was showing some of our, our colleagues, our church structure is standing. Never had it been heard that a church of eight years old will have a sanctuary that can seat a thousand people, built, complete, no money came from anywhere, but from the same people. We have a, a class, classes that are standing now, the school is running about 18 classrooms. And all this came from an independent founded church that is standing on its own with no donation from anywhere. And so churches in Africa are standing up to make a contribution to the world as it were. I don't know if I need to pause here. I'm almost done. <laughs> Is there any question so far on what I've, I've said? Or should I continue? 
I continue. It is true that uh, traditional missionary churches in Southern Africa have long been active in community development. That we cannot argue. Schools were built by these missionary churches, uh, hospitals were built, and so forth and so on. They, they, they are rightfully recognized as relevant actors and contributors by international development agencies. Uh, African initiate, initiated churches, churches like ourselves, uh, uh, lack the recognition, even, even when we are busy trying to make our small contribution. But the tide is changing. We, 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 we really now are beginning to want to get into a space where we can add our small contribution into this. I picked something from your magazine. I'm not sure if I'll, 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 uh, I'll spell this, I'll, I'll, I'll spell this right. The, the Dioch, the Diochland, something like that, edition of, <laughs> of 2017, they right, rightfully noted that religion reaches more people than any other organization through their network and place of worship, and that religious leaders are considered authorities in their communities. This couldn't be more right. So we are taking advantage of that because we are best positioned within our communities. Um, in these eight years of our existence, we also managed to find our roots within the community with at least a membership of between 250 to 300 on, on a given uh, Sunday sitting. The church enjoys more trust than the state in some instances. And I personally agree with the uh, German federal government in saying faith communities are a reserve of values with a great with a creative force. As a result of such, Covenant House Family Church back in Pulukwane is committed to the transformation and development of our local community through education, early childhood uh, education, training, and youth development programs. It is our desire to take advantage of the influence God has given us to make a lasting contribution in the lives of our people. It is not enough to just congregate, just to meet the spiritual needs, and never minister to the social needs of the people God has entrusted us with. Of course, this is not moving as fast as we would want to, but at least we are making a small dent. And one of the things that we have done in trying to achieve this, we have started a program where we call Adopt a School Child. What we have done is we have so far adopted at least 15 primary school children. And what we are trying to do is every beginning of the year we get small packages for them, Unlike giving them food, which we thought, look, it's not going to amount to much. Let's prepare them for the school year. We buy them school shoes. We make sure that they have uniform. Assign a mentor within the school and send one of our church workers on a weekly basis to just check on them, make sure that they are taken care of. Here is the plan with that. reason why we could only take 15, given our small scale, we are trying to say, um, according to scripture, you are blessed to be a blessing. You are, not, you are not blessed until you bless somebody. So we are saying to those children, we will take you from kindergarten, take you through school, through to university. By the grace of God, we trust that by the time they reach their high school, ready to go to university, at least, if not all of them, maybe we can be able to empower half. By the time that half comes back from university, our desire is that at least if you can adopt one and do the same for them as it was done for you. And I believe by the time we come to the age of Church of Pentecost, we would have produced quite a number of professionals. Elise have exten extensively discussed the role of uh, religion in conflict resolution and peace building, governance, wealth creation, and production, and wealth in the African continent. In their view, religion has impacted and continues to do so significantly or make a significant impact in these areas in African communities. They strongly advocate that development or community development is seriously uh, has to take consideration to the people's religion thoughts on matters related to, uh, I think this speaks to what uh, uh, um, a professor spoke to, that uh, 
one thing that we avoided, I think this was seen when the West came in to, to help our people. I think I said this part, in part of my interviews with Philip and them. To say we refused some donors and we were criticized for that. There are people who came wanting to give things to us and I personally said no. And here was the reason. I am of a firm belief in what the Bible says when it says it is more blessed to give than to receive. In other words, the one who is always giving will be more blessed than the one who is always receiving. And our people, especially where I come from, with the missionary churches that came, they came and they gave us everything. And never afforded us an opportunity to give something. And as a result, we have seen that leave our people very poor. So we then say, no, we're not going to do that. What we are going to do is we will only allow people who will come and say, what are you doing? Can we help you in what you're doing? We put something on the table. You equally so put something on the table. In Guyana, where I was born, there is a saying in my language that says, Kupushua leit pusha, which means that if, a, um, if you find a, a, a buffalo lying down, if it's not willing to stand, you can do whatever you want to help it to stand, but you will just fail. And so we have used this approach to say, look, we are not going to just sit here and wait for somebody from somewhere to bring help. We can help ourselves. And which is what we are really trying hard to do. And so the honors, however, must not only rest with the international development community. Uh, on, on the one hand, it behooves African states that institution to involve their religi religious bodies in policy formation and implementation if they value the religious inclination of their citizenry. And it, again, it speaks to that to say, we would not allow people to, we should, we should still maintain our identity even when that help is extended. And that's what we're standing for. And um, we believe that slowly but surely, we will get to that place. Thank you for, for, for that, Cass. Uh, uh, I personally wanted to go to university, and because of my background, uh, the poor background back home, I couldn't. My wife, the same. So the only time I see a university door is when I'm going to preach, and for the first time get an opportunity to come and give a lecture. So based on that, I felt I don't want children around me to go through what I've gone through. So that's what motivated the class. Um, there are two aspects, maybe to try and answer that question. As, as a church, we say we should follow biblical principles of giving and receiving. In all instances where Jesus would want to feed the thousands, for instance, he didn't take anything from himself. He says, what do you have among yourself? So give me what you have, I will work with what you have. The same issue with the prophet, when the woman come crying and say, the, the creditors are coming to take my children. Uh, because my husband died with credit, what do I do? He says, what do you have in your house? Uh, and so, give something to receive something. So the approach is that, um, and, and we have, I think my African brothers will agree, that when the West came, they kept on giving, and they kept on being blessed. 
reason why Europe would keep on being financially blessed is because we keep on giving. So we are saying, give us an opportunity to give something. Just add on what we are giving. I don't know if that came out wrong. Let me just take that aspect of rejecting. It's, it's, it's the attitude of let's give Africans our old clothes. Mm -hmm. That says to me, I don't want them. Why give me your old clothes? Yeah. And two, it's a problem because if you keep giving me according to Bible principle, you go back, you get blessed, I remain with old clothes, they get older, I have to wait for them to come again with old clothes. So why don't you teach me the principle that makes you keep coming with old clothes? Now that they are old, it's because they were new at some point. So I would want to have new clothes at some point. So for me to break away from always getting old clothes, I need to get this thing that is working for you. And we discovered that is number one, let's develop our people. More than giving out grants, let us give them education, when they are trained, they can be employable, they can think outside the box, they can earn their own living. So it is in that context that I say, anybody who wants to partner with what we are doing, it should be towards empowering the people to be able to fend for themselves. It's not necessarily rejecting any form of help. It goes back to what Professor said, that if you want to help me, help, just allow me to maintain my identity. Yeah, they, they, they are. What, what, what would it be if you would? There are great possibilities to do that, um, but given the smaller scale, we're still finding our footing even as a church, being eight years old. So we felt, look, the, the place that we can maybe might be a priority is uh, early childhood development. And what, the other aspect that we have added to that, which I think I left out in my presentation, was that we then realized in the research that we have done back home there. All the kindergarten workers are more like babysitters. Uh, you know, they are there to just watch the children until mommy come home, pick them up, and we realize that. And it's not that they don't want to. The problem is all of them are not trained. They are all not trained. They don't even know what to do with the child. Feed the child, send the child to sleep. Wake up, clean the child, send them home. So we then take an, took initiative with the wife and said, look, there's something that can be done here. Did a little bit of a research, and then we learned that they said, there is any childhood development qualifications that our people are not aware of. We again took about our money, went, registered for that. So now, part of what we are doing while teaching the children, we have opened this kind of a, a skills development in early childhood development to train these teachers. So we go to the schools in villages and say to them, you can do more than just babysitting. Come, we will train you. So that's where sometimes you find, you find difficulties because the government sometimes doesn't want to fund uh, initiatives like that and it becomes costly because you have to train them and then you have to uh, uh, give out certification. So that is on an MQ level five. It's equivalent to a diploma. So that's another aspect of what we're doing. Thanks for bringing that because I, I've left it up. No, it doesn't even go to I don't see ourselves going towards it. It's more social than political. They must be very rich. <laughs> I, I, would, I would say, otherwise, I cannot imagine yeah. how, how, yeah. how, how that is okay. could go on. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I think one, one thing that I should have said earlier maybe it became easier for us to build because I'm a builder myself. Uh, I have a construction background. So in the, in, the, in the building of the infrastructure itself, I was hands on. So that cut a whole lot of, of costs out of it because of projects, fees and employing. A, so all we did was just to employ labor and some of the people would come from our own people. It, it's, not, it's not about being rich at all. But I think it is that determination. Uh, uh, yeah. And I know that uh, another eight years from now, 
we might be attempting a high school. We are coming with the universities. All right. <laughs>
Don't change my identity, that's for one. <laughs> Allow me to be me. Uh, don't divert me from my vision uh, and, and, and what was the driving force. If we can maintain that, then you and me can work hand in hand. I wouldn't prescribe what kind of help as such uh, to, to an extent to say, okay, give this, don't give that, give this. Uh, all I'm talking to is the attitude of you giving what you give. So the counts, like, like I said, an attitude you don't necessarily would put on media. So you would say that this, it could be fine, like, I don't know, Western or like German the, the, I don't know, like the typical, the, I don't know, like the typical combination of like we're the powerful, we want to give uh, media people would come and say like we want to make a great article about something which is independent from Africa. Would you say like this is something that can Look, help you, or is it th that's that's yet another problematic attitude yeah. of giving to be seen? Yeah. I, I find I find it very problematic. If, if I give for attention. I, I think it's even against scripture. Okay. I, I don't do what I do because of some recognition or anything like that. I, if I can do it silently or after I'm gone, somebody will say there was Dawn at some point who did this, that and that, I'll, I'll, I'll be okay with it. Yeah, for, for starters, it's illegal back in South Africa to run a school that is not registered. So we, we had to make sure that we are registered with the, with the relevant authorities. So the authorities are aware. The curriculum that we are using is the curriculum that comes from mainstream. And so, yes, word is out there. But what was very impressive, um, my wife got a call from one of the schools. Remember we're running... Uh, a kindergarten type of a thing up to, I'm not sure how you work it here, up to about six, seven years. So from there, they must go to mainstream. Um, one of the white schools called my wife and said, you know what, I'm very impressed with your child here. Uh, she's far much advanced uh, as compared to some of these children that are coming from other schools. So that impact is felt. To how we also model uh, help other schools there's also another church a full gospel church for that matter the pastor's wife is running the school there when we get back to south africa next week she's sending her teachers uh these are both black and white to our school for the training that i was talking about for them to be trained so that's the kind of uh, uh, uh contribution that we we also are making to other schools so you are becoming more for us already and, and you spread in a way in a way yeah. makes me feel, I don't know how, but thanks, thanks for the observation. <laughs> would you like to come in, Marie? I don't know, would you like to answer first? I think you'll be the right person to do. We can give you some time if you have another question. Can you ask you the example of today's university? <laughs> today? Yeah. Uh,
In my research, I use this project to establish something on how uh, spirit possession started in Ghana. I took it from the project. <laughs> You know, it's quite interesting because when I think of that now as you speak, I just see people like me, they are very sacrificial. And I think it might go back to the same thing that you can only give birth to who you are. So we have got people who are just sacrificial in nature. And not only that, we have seen them blessed, literally. We have just seen the results of their sacrifice. So yeah, they are willing givers. That's why I, I, I can gladly tell you that in eight years, in the city of Pulukwane, there is no church that managed within eight years to build just a church structure. And here we are because of the generosity of the people, we managed to build a, a capacity of a thousand seater and 18 classrooms on the site within that period. So, and it is working for them. It is working for them. Of course, that's, that's in, the, in the horizon. We would love to touch as many lives as possible. But not in the near future, that would take uh, a little bit time. Uh, look, if it took us eight years to do what we did, in the next eight years, look, we did that with almost zero. Where we are today, I think we are better positioned to do three or four times what we did. So in the next eight years, ten years come, I think would have done, would have covered a lot of ground. Yeah, look, uh, we did come across that, but it was more on individual levels and not necessarily government. We would, government supports strongly what we do because we, we demand nothing from them. Instead, we are easing the weight. I'll give an example with the school. Because of uh, uh, you know, people moving from villages to towards the city. And there wasn't much development. Cass and them will tell you that there are no new schools mostly, no new hospitals, no new universities that are being built. And here are people moving more into the cities. Now it puts pressure on the infrastructure itself. So when government hears, oh, there's a church here that is running a school, they are happy to even recommend 
children that can go into mainstream say, by the way, there's a school in such and such a place. So not direct from government, but maybe out of jealousy, you have individuals here who are sitting with documents they are supposed to sign for you to start working, and then they are holding them back for personal money. So it's not necessarily political or governmental that we have. There, there is, for some people, there is a fear of, like they are afraid of your power. I, I wouldn't say afraid of power. Some of them may be because of the misconception of what they see to say, oh, this guy is starting a business, he wants to engage in setup and so forth and so on. So, yeah, more jealousy than fear. Um, if the question is too personal, you may skip it. <laughs> Honestly, if I knew what I know now, eight years ago, I would not have started an independent church. That's the honest truth. I would probably would have looked for a church like that that shares the same common goal and vision and make my contribution. But because of lack of that uh, 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 within my background, unfortunately, I had to stand up as a pioneer because there was no reference to such that we wanted to do. And I think that is the pain of being a pioneer. And I believe the founders of those churches many years ago might have encountered what I have encountered that pushed them to eventually say, you know what, I need to start something that will stand as a specimen for people to learn from. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I would understand that question in a sense here, that how would we say we have grown when we look back and say we, we now have grown because we see this has happened. It's like this. If we can see those children coming out with the regalia from university, making an impact in society, changing other lives. That for me will define growth. I would say we have really done what we, we aimed to do in the beginning. I think we can just leave that open-ended. There are a number of possibilities. As long as it does not compromise our calling and our vision, we wouldn't mind because the issue is not about me, it's about achieving yeah. that which we envision. And what is your vision? <laughs> <laughs> My vision as an individual or as a church or as a school? As a church. As a church. Of course, is to... Okay. <laughs> um, I think everything that I've said, it's in a way trying to break down what we envision. That contribution to society, that's exactly what our vision is. <laughs>